Hey, I'm Eric Rokich with FitnessBusinessInterviews.com, and today I have Mr. Brian Devlin here with me. Now, Brian has literally been kicking ass with his business, so I'm really excited to have him come on here and share what's working for him. I mean, not only does he have a successful offline business, but he's absolutely crushing it online. He's got so many great tips, pieces of advice for all of us to learn from, so I had to get him on here to come and share everything with us. So, Brian, appreciate the time and having you come on here. Man, thanks, Eric. I just want to first just thank you for what you're doing for the industry, man. I mean, it's it's awesome uh, the content that you're providing. Uh, you know, you know, five years ago, people would have to pay like twenty five, thirty dollars a month to receive a just an audio CD in the mail. You know, with interviews like this, and you're just giving away for free on your site. And I just don't, you know. Yeah, man. I mean, I hope the fitness industry realizes the value that you're providing by getting into the minds of all these people, you know, that are doing really well in the industry. So thank you. Oh, well, no, thank you. I appreciate it. I love doing it. And I love being able to just connect with, with awesome people and get them to share their tips. So I, I appreciate the uh, comments there. So thanks. Glad to help. All right. So let's do this because, uh, you know, you've kind of got, you know, a pretty big following online. You do really well offline. Let's just get a little bit of background information, how you got into the fitness industry. So, you know, briefly just kind of explain that for everybody. Sure. I mean, the, the, the honest truth is I was just a big nerd in high school. And, um, you know, I had glasses and, uh, and I was real skinny and, um, and I wasn't getting any girls. And so I just started going to the YMCA with my friend and working out and uh, started putting on muscle. And before I knew it, I was just like, I be had become an expert in putting muscle on. Uh, you know, I went and got Arnold Schwarzenegger bodybuilding encyclopedia. I think there was a book called Sliced Out at the time, which was um, all about sports nutrition and supplementation. And I like, I like memorized it. I bought this program called Cybergenics, and I started doing Cybergenics, which was like you know that thing you buy at GNC. So I got into it. And I kept getting all these you know amazing results, uh, and my body kept changing and. Um, by the time I hit college, I was you know in great shape, and everyone was asking me, "Hey, man, how are you doing all this stuff?" So, um, long story short, is I, it sort of started as you know a necessity to try and change my life from being a big nerd to being more popular, and it turned into a lifelong passion. Um, so that that's the that's the short of how I got started in the fitness industry. Um, okay. Yeah. So basically, that's how I developed my passion for fitness. Okay. Now, at what point was it? where you took that passion and decided to turn it into a business. I mean, did you end up going and, you know, working at a big box gym and do that, that whole trainer type of thing, that progression, or are you just like, okay, I'm going to start my own business and go from there? Well, it started, well, in college, um, I, I was, you know, I had a couple friends in college that I was training for free. We'd work out together and give them advice. And um, so what happened was that transformed into uh, me going into the Coast Guard after graduating from college. But that's a long story how I got there. We'll get into that in another interview. So I wound up in the Coast Guard, and you know I was doing the same thing with my Coast Guard buddies. And they noticed, hey, man, Brian, you know a lot about health and fitness and everything, so why don't we do this? Why don't we send you to health and fitness leadership school, and we'll make you the, health guard, or the uh, Coast Guard health and wellness coordinator. And so that's when I guess I started understanding that, you know, this is an actual um, career path and that there are, there's a need for this in, in, in the world. And so I started as a health and wellness coordinator for the Coast Guard. And as, as that transpired and, you know, some, some, some uh, events took place in my life that made me really question why I'm here and things like that, you know, I, I realized that, you know, I wanted to do this for a living, so I wanted to become a personal trainer. Uh, so I went to the United States Sports Academy in Daphne, Alabama, and I got certified through their continuing ed program. Um, it's, a, it's the only freestanding graduate school of sports science, and so we had, I had really good training. And uh, so, yes, to make a long story short, I started in a big box gym, and um, that's an interesting story how I got there. Um, but uh, once once inside the big, big box gym is when it all started. Okay, at what point were you like, I'm going to do my own thing? Well, from the beginning, actually, I walked into the gym on a two-week two free pass that I had gotten from a church uh, that I, I joined when I moved to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. It was Seacoast Church, and they gave me this two-week pass to this gym. And so I walked in thinking, okay, well, I'll, I'll get this two-week pass, and I'll see if they're hiring trainers. And that was basically, I was a certified trainer, and I, and I asked to be hired. And the, the, the girl at the front desk was like, 
we don't hire trainers. They just work here. And I, and I was like, well, if they just work here, how do they get the job? You know? Right. And she's like, I don't know. They just work here. Okay. And so <laughs> I reached into my bag and handed her my resume. You know, it was like the typical, uh, girl at the front desk, like hates to be there kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And, I remember, and said, look, just here's my resume. Can you just give this to somebody that might uh, be interested in hiring people? And maybe I can check back later. And I went to work out. And when I was sitting on the bench press, you know, the proverbial bench press where everybody starts their workouts, uh, I'm sitting there, you know, getting ready to work out. And this dude walks up to me and he's like, hey, man, I'm, I own the gym. Uh, can I talk to you? And uh, so I, I just said, sure, no problem. And so we talked and he said, I'm looking for a morning manager. And I said, well, that's not really what I want to do. I don't want to manage a gym. I want to be a personal trainer. So, well, I'm looking for a morning manager from 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. Here's the deal. If you manage this place for $200 a week, which is like $5 an hour, uh, what I'll, and, and you're going to get $35 for every membership you sell. But here's the, here's the kicker. When you get off at 1, I'll let you train in here, you know, offer your services to all the members mm. till 7 o'clock at night, and I won't take a dime. So you're a manager, but we get off at one and you can train. And I was like, that's it. I'm doing that. So I would get up at three in the morning. I would work till one and sell these <laughs> members. I'd get off at one and I would just sit and talk to members and try and educate them on fitness. And I never really tried to sell fitness. I would just work out with them and things like that. It started, people started you know, saying, hey, Brian really knows what he's talking about. He can answer questions here. He can answer questions there. And so um, eventually I got the the bright idea, <clears throat> excuse me, why don't I put together a package and when I sell a gym membership, I offer my services for a discounted rate, sort of like a Groupon. <laughs> so I, I was, I was um, inadvertently uh, one of the, the mindset of the Groupon sort of, I just discounted everything half price and I ordered 10, I uh, gave them 10 sessions for you know, a low amount. And uh, I mean, within six months, Eric, I was completely booked, booked solid with training, and 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 it went from there. And uh, you know, I think the gym is a really strong learning place for a personal trainer. You know, I think that you, to be a really successful personal trainer, probably starting a gym is is the best bet. Okay, and I want to know. I mean, this was a little while back when you were doing this, but you were in the gym and you were just talking, you were just helping people, and then you came up with this package. What did you do? Like, how did you pitch that to them? How did you offer it to them? Or were they coming to you and saying, listen, I'll pay you to train to train me? You know, it's really good uh, that you brought that up. Because what I did was um, I'm selling membership, and I would just ask them about their lives. And I would say, like, so well, how long have you been working out for? Well, I haven't been really working out. Well, um, you know, what do you want to get out of this gym membership? Well, I, want, I just want to get back in shape. And I said, cool. do you have a plan to do that, you know? And, um, and I would just talk to him. I wasn't really hard selling it, but I was, I was more like surveying the market because I didn't really know how to start a business. So I was like, well, you know, how do you uh, entice somebody to actually want to work with you? And, and, and I found that the more questions I asked, the more they wanted to, to know to me to ask another question. And so the more questions I asked, the more I was building rapport with them and the more I – I, I was um, I appeared to them, which I actually did, is that I cared about what their answers were. And um, it was really simple. I mean, I just would just say, you know, so what do you want to get out of this? So what have you ever accomplished anything? Like, so have you ever like been at like a size two and 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 now you're at a size ten? Have you, you know, have you ever been a size two before? Oh, when I was, you know, when I was in college, I was I was like a size four. And I, I felt so good. I'm like, well, what you know, what makes you think you can't get back there? I don't know, you know, just like stuff going on in my life and, you know, the Southern cooking and all that stuff. And I was, you know, what, what I have like sort of an accountability program. Why don't I, you want to, you want to hear about it? Like I, I'll actually be your coach, you know, and I'm, I'm offering a very low discounted rate. If you want to, I'm, I'm new in the area here. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't know anybody. I was a health and wellness coordinator for the United States Coast Guard. I trained with the Navy SEALs. I'll tell you right now, I can get the weight off you. You just got to give me a chance, and um, and if I do it for you at a really discounted rate, and you tell all your friends about me, I'll you know I'll I'll continue to train you at this discounted rate for as long as we're friends, you know, as long as we we um, we help each other, and um, and you stick to my program and you 
become a good poster child. So I did that with a couple people. And I mean, it was like, it was in a gym. The gym is a viral environment. Yeah. You know, you, you can go really high, really fast in a gym, or you can be like a loser really fast in a gym. So what, what happened was I just became passionate about the people I was working with and sort of got tunnel vision on them. And I let their results speak for themselves. And I think that that's a big mistake that you see in the industry now is that the client, the, the trainer is concerned with while they're working with Mr. Jones, they're concerned with how they're going to get Betty, Sue, and Jennifer into their program. And they're, they're not even really realizing that Mr. Jones isn't changing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So what I did was I just like, I just got tunnel vision on my, on my clientele and I made sure uh, that they got massive results. And so when they were in the locker room taking a shower and they're talking to their friends and they're like, dude, you look awesome. What have you been doing? I've been training with Brian. Well, that's the best way to get business, mm -hmm. especially in a viral environment like that. So the next thing I know, everyone's coming up to me and asking me questions about fitness. And you know, very rarely was I ever approached with like, how much did you cost? Or what do you charge for your services? Um, or what am I going to get with working with you? It, 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 and it, like when you think about fitness advertising and stuff like that, it was more like, hey, I saw what you did with Bob. It's amazing, man. Like, how, how did you do that? And I'm like, well, listen, uh, this is what I did. I just kept him accountable on his diet. You know, he, he meets with me three times a week. And I have unlimited, you know, you can talk to me whenever you need to. If you need a, a pep talk, whatever, I'm here. I'm your coach. I'm here. I'm here for you. He's like, that's awesome. Sign me up. Never even <laughs> talk about price. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. So I think it, it starts with a really strong passion for the individual you're working with. It's never, if you want to go into any business, especially the fitness industry. Never go into it dialed in on being a six-figure trainer. Dial in on being a killer trainer who changes lives and makes a difference in people's lives. And I think that that's where we are getting really off track in the fitness industry, big time. Yeah, no, I agree. I definitely agree. <laughs> Let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, at that point in six months, you said you were booked solid. Did you end up taking over the gym? Or did you end up going and getting your own place? How did that all work out? Okay, that's a really interesting question. So, and, and this is where it's it, this is where vision comes in. Like when you're a trainer and you, things are going really well for you, you immediately want to think scalability. Okay, so if, if things are going really well for you, that's a sign you're in the right niche, you're at the right time, and you have the potential to explode. All right, so now you have to think scalability. So. Well, there's only one of you, right? And so you can only have so many hours in a day to devote to your craft. And how can you, how can you maximize that process and get the, the, the most results for your clients and yourself at the same time? So immediately what I did was I was like, okay, I'm the new guy in town. I'm the lowest man on the totem pole, but I'm kicking butt here. I'm starting to get a little bit of like the evil eye from the other trainers. And so um, I have to make sure I nip that in the bud. <clears throat> And on top of that, I have to make sure I still stand out as, as the go-to trainer. So I looked around the gym and I, and I noticed that behind the, um, the front desk was just an empty room. It was almost like it was a, like a, like a walk-in closet. But on the other side of the room was a, a wall that went up straight out to the gym, at the open floor. So I, I was like, if I could acquire this room and put a door in here, then I could actually create an office space and I would be the only trainer in the gym that actually had an office. What that would do for me is it would set me apart visually um, from it from the, the clientele uh, because everybody that's on the treadmills would be looking at my office. Okay. And then on top of that it would set me apart um, <clears throat> professionally because there's something about a headquarters unit that really will make somebody stand out over someone that doesn't have a headquarters unit. You know, you've got the proverbial backpack boot camp trainer who like drives up with their truck. They've got all the cones and stuff in the back and they go to a park and they use the park. Well, they are never going to be held in as high esteem by the community at large as someone that has a uh, lease, a, a light industrial space, put gymnastics flooring down, may have a higher overhead, but has an actual headquarters where they are known for their boot camps. If you look at Sam Bakhtiar, you know, he's like the, the man with boot camps. And 
Sam doesn't do outdoor boot camps, he does indoor boot camps. And his boot camps explode all over the United States. And that's probably because he's taken that same principle of setting himself apart from the norm. And so when I got that office, I hired one of uh, one of the guys in the gym was a, a general contractor. I said, look, bro, I'll give you some sessions um, for you and your girlfriend. Just put a doorway in for me. So we sat there on the busiest time of day and we put this doorway in this big, big wall. And like everybody that walked by was like, what are you guys doing? And I was like, oh, we're making an office. You know, I've got a lot of clients now and uh, I want to make sure that I, I keep treating them very well and give them everything they need. So I'm going to be starting to get some really cool you know, equipment and programming stuff in here, assessment tools. And, you know, I'm going to need a place to keep all that stuff and, uh, you know, interview uh, prospective clients in a more, uh, you know, private environment. And, like, so immediately everyone was like, wow, that's such a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Okay. And I think that was what, what really got me on the second notch of the totem pole. And uh, and and so that that was probably the first step I took to get – to move up the ascension ladder. Okay. And you were still be you were still the manager there working underneath this guy and you were able to do that. I was. Okay. So at what point did it get to where I mean, did you, you know, did you take this business over for him or did you move out? When did that happen? Okay, so what happens next is um I look around and I'm, I'm getting booked up. I'm working from one till seven, pretty much full time. I'm getting kind of exhausted, and I, and I was like, okay, I feel like God is telling me that this is my calling. Uh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I had a really strong uh, faith that led me there, and I had a really strong internal belief that I was supposed to be doing this for a living. So I went to the gym owner and I said, listen. I know I'm your number one salesman because I was. I was closing like seven memberships a week. Um, or no, more than that. I was like 14 memberships a week. It was crazy how amount I was closing. But it was just because I would. I had this system where I'd walk everyone through the gym. I'd show them all the equipment. But I would also talk to them about the benefits of this versus this. And I wouldn't try and sell them anything. I was basically educating them on what a gym was. And in educating them on what a gym was, they wanted to know more about, about how a gym could help them. Instead of educating them why we're better than other gyms, I just educate them on what a really good gym was, like what, what, what you should look for in a gym and, and what, what it's there for and, um, and how, how to use a gym for your, for your success. And it sort of sold itself. And um, so he was like, well, I mean, Brian, you're, you're closing 14 memberships a week for me here uh, at times, and you're the number one salesman. Why would I want to let you go and let you run your own training business? What's in it for me? I said, all right, well, how can I do this? So I thought about it, and um, I was like, okay, how can I make him popular but still maintain my passion? So I was like, all right, I got it, I got it, I got it. I'll teach classes for you. I will put together the most kick-butt boot camp class in the morning and the evening, and I'll do it for free. And you just let me out of this thing. I'll do it for free for a few months and build up, you know, your memberships by giving this, because it was, it was included in the gym membership, you know? So now you're getting me who is a book, a book solid personal trainer with your gym membership. So it's like a huge draw. Um, cause like, you know, all the girls were going out and they're eating at Chick-fil-A and with their, you know, their, their, um, soccer moms are eating there, you know, with their little kids playing on the jungle gyms. And they're like, oh, God, Brian kicked my butt today, you know? And they're like, who's this Brian guy? Oh, he's this, this trainer over here at Mount Pleasant. And, and, um, you know, but actually he's doing these boot camp classes. You, all you gotta do is join the gym. And so like all these people were coming in and joining. So it, it was a win-win. And, um, and so what happened was, uh, the, the manager, the, the owner of the gym let me get out of the managing position. And I just became, a boot camp instructor and a personal trainer, and uh, and from there, uh, I negotiated to be paid for the boot camps, and then I actually started my own private boot camps by renting an unused uh, facility. It was like an unused um, spinning room. The guy was teaching spinning in there in the evenings, and it was all cement floors, and it was crappy, and there was no air conditioning. And there was like four people taking classes every night. And I was like, dude, this is like 1,500 square feet of absolute a prime real estate for me. 
So I worked a deal with the, the gym owner to let me use that space on a, um, a per morning and per afternoon basis. And I grew a really killer boot camp in there. Uh, and so I had my personal training and then I had my boot camps and, um, and then I decided that I wasn't happy. So I, I went to massage therapy school in the evenings, <laughs> uh, after I, you know, after I wasn't getting up at three o'clock in the morning anymore. So, um, I enrolled in massage therapy and neuromuscular school and I got my neuromuscular therapy license. And so I started incorporating that into, uh, into my training programs a year later. And I think that's when it really exploded for me. Okay. Now, what types of struggles did you have during this period and, and how did you overcome them? Because, I mean, you obviously had to deal with the, the owner of the gym and trying to figure out how to get out through all that. But you were building your business once you had the boot camps. What were some of the struggles you had and how did you overcome them? Okay, I think the biggest struggle I had right off the bat was getting um, – getting established and very successful in a, a land of independent contractors without causing a revolt against me. Mm -hmm. So that means that I had to be delivering just as much uh, value to the other trainers in the facility as I was to the clientele in the facility because in a, in a gym environment, anybody that's listening to this and works in a gym environment that uses independent contractors will know that it's kind of a cutthroat game. You know, it's, it's like every man for himself. Um, and so if one person gets too big, the people around that see that and they're like, well, we got to take them down a notch because, you know, this can't happen. We can't have a kingpin in here. And so it's really, I think, the biggest part and I think where I grew the most as a person is learning how to balance my own personal agenda with the feelings and um, like my own personal agenda here with the feelings and needs of other people that are trying to do the same thing as me here and never appearing to anybody as, as wanting to be like the kingpin, like wanting to be like the top dog. It's just, I just wanted to be the best that I could be. And in doing so, I became the top dog, but it was not my intention to, to ever like stand, like, you know, stand at the top of a mountain, look down at everyone else and be like, you know, you, you guys wish you could be like me. That was never my intention. I think that that's probably a big struggle that you, that I had to overcome with, um, with trying to grow, but not grow with an ego. Uh, because when you get successful, it's really hard not to develop an ego. And it was really cool because what I would do is I would work out with the other trainers and I'd just, I'd give them advice and I'd give them clients. You know, if I was too busy, I, you know, I'd, uh, I'd help them find their niches. You know, like one person had this really, she stretched me one day and I was like, I was like, girl, you have like got the most amazing ability to stretch someone. Like my hips feel like brand new. I'm like, why don't we develop a total niche for you in stretching? And so I started sending my clients to her for stretching and she just started blowing up with the stretching business at $35 a pop. Well, now I'm not so much of a threat anymore. I'm, I'm a really good person sending her business. And now, now we're, now we're having a really nice environment where everyone's happy and everybody's growing and everybody's finding their niche. And, and so I think that was probably the biggest struggle was in, in a, in a sea of, of, um, you know, limited opportunity and, um, and lots of talent, you know, you never want to alienate yourself from the others in your, in your industry by trying to be the proverbial, you know, king of the mountain. I think the king of the mountain will ultimately have a very lonely life. Yeah, yeah I agree. So you've got this, you know, going well, you have the other trainers, you've overcome those things. Other trainers aren't pissed off at you. They're kind of happy you're working together with them. Do you at some point go and get your own place or do you continue to build the business there? Okay, so here, here's where I'm at. Um, I'm at uh, capacity with my boot camps. I'm at capacity with my personal training. And then I decide, hey, listen, why don't I try and duplicate myself? It's the craziest idea in the world to try and duplicate yourself within uh, an environment of independent contractors who are ultimately – after the same thing you are, but hell, I'm going to try it, right? So 
what I did was I took uh, one of the girls that I saw came in a lot. She looked really fit. She seemed very into her workouts. I just approached her one day and I said, "What do you want from your life? You know, what are you what are you doing? What are you what are you passionate about?" And she was like, "Well, you know, I I want to do this, that, and the other thing, but I also kind of want to be a trainer." And I just found it was like an intuition. So I was like, "Why? Don't I, what if I taught you?" everything I know about being a trainer and you work for me and I just, I gave you everything except 30% of your income. And so, um, and I book, you know, everything. And, and so I talked to the gym owner and he was like, oh, you can try it, man, but I just don't think it's gonna, gonna work. Now at this time I'm paying the gym owner like $2,000 rent between the massage room that I had built out right. and, and the, uh, the uh, conditioning studio that I had built out for boot camps. So, you know, I'm coming to him like, you know, a businessman. I'm saying, listen, I'm going to try and grow a business inside your business. Are you cool? And he was like, I want to see you try and pull this thing off. But, you know, I don't, I don't know how I feel about it, you know, because I think he was starting to sense like, well, what if, what if he starts this big business inside my business? And, yeah. but then he realized like the more that people are in his gym, the more popular his gym's going to be. So it was just, it was just a win win. Well, I got this girl, um, and, uh, she worked out for a little while and then just decided one day that, hey, she's got a full book and she doesn't want to work for me anymore. And you can't really sign a no compete inside a gym. It's just not something that's going to be enforceable. And then you look like a total, uh, in your word, douchesaurus <laughs> if, if you uh, try to like, you know, file an injunction against an independent contractor in the gym for breaking the contract. So I said, I'll give it one more shot. And I found this girl, same kind of story. Uh, and she wound up being my girlfriend's roommate at the time. So I had a little bit more of an emotional uh, advantage there because she's not going to want to screw me over knowing that she's living uh, and yeah. renting a bedroom in my girlfriend's house. So that was so that was so that was such a blessing to have that. So she wound up working for me for like a year or so. And, um, and you know, it was great. We were doing really well. And then I got in an altercation at, uh, at the facility with uh, the owner. And um, within, I think it was like within like three or four days, I was pretty much asked to leave. And it was, it was kind of weird because we were going just skyrocketing. Like we were, we were, um, we had so much potential and so much movement. And I was like, right before it happened, I, I remember sitting there and, and I was sitting in my car and I always used to, um, well, I, I like to read the Bible before I go into work in the morning. So I'm, I'm sitting in my car and reading the Bible and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just sort of praying and I'm saying, like, I just don't feel like I want to really even be here anymore. You know, I, it's, I feel like I'm building myself a prison with walls because as I expand, I'm still within the confines of this guy's dominion. And, and, and it's, you know, the, the, the verse in the Bible says, uh, you know, a wise man does not build his house on the sand, he builds his house on the rock. Well, building your house in a gym is like building your house in, in the sand because your your foundation is, is, is really not solid. It's just up to the gym owner whether or not he wants you there. And if they want you out of there, they're going to get you out of there. So that's what happened. Um, and uh, so, you know, the gym owner booted me out and I, and I had to start over from scratch. So here's what I learned from all that is that there's a system and the system is that you start at the bottom of the totem pole and you just be the best you can be, all right? And then as you provide value in people's lives, your world will grow. But if you already have you know, a reputation that's preceding you in town, it happens a lot faster, so you can go somewhere a lot faster. And, um, and so, you know, I, I, I just uh, I floundered around for a little bit for like a week or so trying to find a place that wanted like 60, 60 clients and a, and a trainer um, who had a really uh, strong reputation for getting results. And I finally landed this, uh, this gig at a, a guy's personal training studio. And I said, uh, I, I, I met, went in and met with him. And this is really good because if you're in a gym right now, this is how you can get out of the gym. This is, this is gold. So you can take your clients and use your clients as leverage because your clients are guaranteed income. Um, you know, they're following you and they believe in you and they're, they're like a source of leverage. So if you look at what, what's the, the lifetime value of a client in the personal training world is about $5,000 a year. So if you had 40 to 60 clients, I mean, you're, you're carrying a, a huge 
giant boulder of leverage with you mm -hmm. as long as they're they're still following you and they're willing to follow you wherever you go and if you're good they will now you can say hey listen what, what if i could completely like remove your rent from your facility and allow you to operate at no cost and that's basically what i did so you know i got into this facility at a 70 30 split uh of my revenue that i brought in uh, and uh, from my clients and 30% would go to him. Well, I was training so many people and had so many programs available that I could lateral right into the boot camps, lateral right into the personal training. I paid his rent. I paid his rent. His rent was $3,500 a month and my 30% was covering his rent. So that would give you an idea of how many clients I was bringing and how, how, how quickly you know, that deal went down. Within one year of doing that, I just decided, hey, look, man, I got to stop being afraid, and um, I have to, I have to, I have to see, you know, I'm ready to get out on my own and do this. And uh, it, it was really cool, man. It was like a defining moment in my life when I was sitting on. He had this wrestling mat in his facility. It was like a 12 by 12 wrestling mat. Um, you know, it was real thick foam and I talk about this in my book The Underground Fitness Method here I'm standing on this big blue mat I had seen like 15 people that day and I was just exhausted and I was looking around and I was like okay you know I'm, I'm making enough money to, to buy cars and cash here um, you know I, I, there's no shortage of people that want to work with me I'm doing so well but I'm miserable why am I miserable and, and I just realized it's because I'm always I'm always part of someone else's picture. I'm always part of someone else's dream. And I was like, well, what about my dream? What is my dream? And I started thinking, and I just kept thinking and thinking and thinking, and I'm sitting on this big blue mat, and I'm like, my dream is to be the person who has the facility that can foster in all this change in the community by developing my team of professionals to serve them. And I was like, I have got to step out in faith. I've got to get, I've got to just get off my butt and make this happen. And so I did, you know, I, I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, this is my 60 days notice in 60 days. I'll be gone. And, um, you know, I'm going to do it on my own. And, uh, what transpired next is pretty amazing. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,